Um, just a few words from, to myself. Uh, I'm a physician by training, working currently in the biophysics department at the university. And um, I am applying machine learning in my research and researching for a method to make my own um, research reproducible. And I came across this uh, series of papers by Stanisic et al, which introduced this combination of um, quite simple, but at the same time, extensive tools, which I pre will present today. And I try to keep it um, as technical as necessary, uh, but not more. Okay, so let's dive in. First, what are we talking about? So um, there's something um, as a computational research life cycle for people who are computing in their research. And this usually goes through different stages. So the first one would be the individual exploration. We're trying to test an idea or an algorithm, a question with a small scale data set. We usually code a lot of experimental code and see what works and what doesn't. And tools which investigators might use are, for example, Excel, MATLAB, Mathematica, Sage, or for statistics, R or SPSS. Then, at some point, we might want to bring, out, bring in collaborators who also want to work on the code or have some expertise. And there we do this via email or a version control system. We might also just put the code in a Dropbox or at a GitHub repository. Or if we work in the final paper together, this is something I uh, myself experience as well. We have these uh, kind of incredibly long um, uh, names for documents where we append our uh, current contributions. Then, at some kinds of uh, in some kinds of research, like uh, working with high performance computing, for example. Um, there's usually another another stage where we have to transform our code so that it is runnable on these machines. They usually need compiled code or some special computing libraries. And this might be different than our in initial in exploration. And finally, uh, at some point we want to publish, write an internal paper or report or visualize our re results. And this again needs different tools like LaTeX, Google Docs, Word, PowerPoint. So this is the tools which are used at the moment. And in this talk today, I uh, want to present one setup which can encompass this whole life cycle. So which can be used as a initial exploration tool and but at the same time is flexible enough to make it uh, last for production and even for publication and education. Why do we want to do this? Well, first of all, we have a certain pressure to go uh, through the different stages uh, forward. We want to we have this pressure to publish and we have this pressure to share our uh, results, but seldomly we have really the pressure or the need to go back and make sure that our code is reproducible. Um, so initiatives like we heard of today, they try to do that. Secondly, um, the manual, then usually there is a lot of manual transfer involved between these different stages. And this, of course, is prone to errors. Of course, all these problems are both technical and social. And today I mainly focus on the technical issues, but uh, the social ones uh, have to be addressed as well. Also, uh, in the title of the talk, I mentioned reproducibility, and I just wanted to make clear um, there are different kinds of reproducibility. The one I am talking to about today is methods reproducibility, as defined by Goodman et al., um, where we have we try to make a, a scientific approach, a pipeline, uh, as reproducible as possible. So it deals with study protocols, reusable metadata, code, and results. Okay, so first I want to give a short overview of the possibilities and capabilities of these tools I have got in the title. First, org mode. So this is a plain text based tool and it was originally written for outlining 
or uh, project planning, you could say. At the right, you see an example for a trip planning um, document, and you can have certain aspects there. You can have a simple spreadsheet or also more complex spreadsheets. You can do lists and um, check boxes and ad address timestamps or to dos. And there's also, or it is also a markup language. So similar to Markdown, you have these simple ways to make text bold or to link, uh, introduce links. Um, also, it is a literature programming environment. So what was introduced into this um, augmod files is that you can use these source blocks so up here with begin source and source, you have um, defined a source block and it is given a name in this case demo and you can execute this block and get a result. Also in the same document, you can combine these kind of codes with other languages. So here, for example, is a Python source block calling this C++ source block and doing some computation with it. So this is incredibly powerful. Um, and this kind of notebook environment might be known to some of you, for example, who use Jupyter notebooks or uh, R and Markdown notebooks. And this is a really similar approach, but a bit more powerful. Another feature which is really useful in org mode is that you can one click publish. So uh, you just uh, have a certain key combination and you can get out of one Markdown document or markup language document a full-fledged modern website or a LaTeX document or ODT. Lastly, because it is plain text, it is seamlessly compatible with Git. Now let's look at the second tool, MLflow. So this really comes from the machine learning part of my research and MLflow is an industry standard or quite standard, so it is used widely because it makes this whole machine learning life cycle, which is uh, comprised of these different training runs uh, with a lot of parameters and metadata. Um, and up to this point where you want to actually serve a final model for production. So the three main aspects of MLflow are a tracking API to lock the different parameters and code and results. Secondly, you can define experimental projects uh, where you can subsumize the different runs uh, and also automatize the runs and do uh, hyperparameter searches. So basically, you define a certain file which then um, is used in, in, in the code base of MLflow um, to make these kind of runs reproducible. You can, for example, define the environment, the computational environment it is run in, and the entry points for your scripts which ru actually run the code. Finally, it also defines a certain model format, um, which is basically usable with any open source uh, machine learning library and makes this model serving uh, possible no matter where your model or with which tools your model was trained on. Okay, and for the third tool, we have Git, which is a distributed version control system. And how it usually works is that uh, some users or core developers share their code uh, with an open license and put it into a repository. So we already uh, have heard about GitLab or GitHub today. Then each time they make changes in the code, this is versioned. So this is where the version comes from. And because it's distributed and also uh, hosted, other people can clone it, external people, uh, introduce new features or um, also put on uh, pull requests, so requests for new uh, features or also own implementations to the core developers. And in general, review the code and all versions. Also, it is possible with the open licenses to create derived work from the code and put it again in a version control system. So, Let's put these together and see what we can come up with. Stanisic et al, they really had this idea of bridging the author reader gap in experiments and papers. So normally we have this kind of pipeline 
comprising of first experiments, then analysis, at some point we have a published article and a text to it. And the author, of course, thinks in this pipeline from left to right, and the reader tries to get back the information. How was the actual experiment performed and which kinds of codes were used? Um, so they say this actually, so their, their approach was to make this pipeline or to bridge this gap by two main steps. The first one, an open laboratory notebook. So this is the org mode step. That means that you basically record your own experiments in this notebook. It is usable as a notebook. Um, and at the same time, in the end, actually um, make this uh, public so that you can actually uh, see all the failed results as well and all the uh, design decisions because in this notebooks you can uh, outline the exposition the original data the analyses the discussion second of all you version the research process to facilitate reproduction so there are this is the most technical part but bear with me there are three main uh, things, how this is done. The first one is a coherent data file organization. So it should be clear, coherent and hierarchical so that you have a certain setup which you can follow with, for example, the data you create and use, the source code and tests that make sure that the source code is usable. Secondly, a certain Git branching structure. So they outline that you have a certain source code branch in Git and then you branch out experiments from the source code, which can later be reproduced by checking out the certain experimental branch and the results are merged back in a data branch. So this is something you really have to look into if you're interested. There are certain courses how to do that, but this is the general idea to uh, kind of um, dif make a difference between the development and the results storage with Git. And third of all, all the key analysis details are stored in these org mode lab books. So you can track the provenance of your data through literal programming in these documents. It links all the scripts, programs, shell commands, parameters, data transformations you do. Uh, it's pretty flexible. As I said, you can use it for individual exploration and in the end for storage. And it is also one click executable which makes it easier to reproduce results if you clone these uh, repositories, for example. So my own extension of this approach was to uh, introduce MLflow, as I outlined, to bridge or to actually cover this ML lifecycle. Secondly, uh, to add a bit more open source practices. So to, for example, make sure that the dependencies are set up coherently, so with tools like Docker, and to automate the testing of the code, uh, for example, with Tox for Python, and also to automate the code documentation. Thirdly, um, the one-click publishing features I uh, I told you about for org mode makes it really easy to share your results uh, either with collaborators or people who are not directly involved in the project. So you can share this website and you can give your figures and the code which led to it. And it's even uh, usable for teaching if you, uh, so this is not uh, what I did till now, but it should be straightforward. So for a short discussion, what are the pros and cons of this approach? This pro, uh, the pros are it's a combination of well-known, lightweight and open source technologies. And it facilitates reproducibility without taking away too much flexibility of the user. The cons are, the main cons are that some of these conventions are not commonly used. Like for example, this Git branching model also, some tools have a steep learning curve, so org mode is not a straightforward tool to learn. And the preferred editor is Emacs to really leverage the full power. And lastly, for really large files, Git is not ideal. So there are some tools which uh, can you can use to uh, do that, like Git LFS or Git NX, 
but this is not uh, in this approach directly uh, in there. Okay, and lastly, some alternatives would be Jupyter Notebooks or R and Nita for literal programming, but I think it doesn't encompass this whole um, different possibilities I uh, told you about. Okay, with this, I would be uh, done and open for questions. Um, and thank you for your attention.